Hi everyone, and welcome to this tutorial bite for Oxygen Not Included, which is about research reactors and nuclear power. These are only in the spaced out DLC, and are very useful builds that use enriched uranium to make power and nuclear waste. I'm going to quickly look at how to get enriched uranium, and then at two reactor designs. So before setting up a reactor, we need to get the enriched uranium fuel, and this starts with uranium ore. This is found naturally in radioactive and frozen biomes, and can be dug up, or in radioactive gas clouds and ore fields to be collected through space mining, which I covered in the tutorial bite for spaced out rocketry. With the uranium ore, there are two ways to convert this into enriched uranium. The first method is using the uranium centrifuge, and the second is using beaters. Let's start with the uranium centrifuge, as it's quite simple. Uranium ore is supplied, and then converted into enriched uranium, also making liquid uranium as a waste product, which will solidify into depleted uranium. This depleted uranium has no particular use, but is a refined metal. Its melting point is only 133 degrees Celsius though, so its uses are very limited. Make sure to manage the heat output from this machine, for example by including it in an industrial brick, but it is otherwise very simple. The main downside to the uranium centrifuge is the conversion rate. Only 20% of the uranium ore is turned into enriched uranium, and the rest into depleted uranium, so a lot of mass is lost. Also remember that for dug up uranium ore, half the mass will already be lost when the tile is dug. This is why beaters are really the preferred method for converting uranium ore into enriched uranium. I will cover beaters as part of the Critter Tutorial Byte series, but let's look at the basics here. Beaters spawn from a hive, spending two days as a bee tiny. They mature into an adult beater, and live for a further three days, during which they fly around and collect uranium ore, either from natural tiles or debris. This is taken back to the hive, which then refines it into enriched uranium. Dupes can harvest the hives to drop the enriched uranium to be collected and used. Beware that beaters can sting dupes, but they can be put to sleep with carbon dioxide. Also note that beaters live at very cold temperatures, like their natural habitat, and will die above 0 degrees Celsius. They convert 90% of the uranium ore into enriched uranium, so are four and a half times better than the uranium centrifuge. But because beaters can also harvest natural tiles, you won't lose half the mass digging them, so are nine times better in this case. With the fuel gathered, let's now jump into the first full reactor design. This is a fairly simple design, and consumes 10 kilograms per cycle of enriched uranium, providing an average net power output of around 4.5 kilowatts. It will also make nuclear waste at 100 kilograms per cycle, which is a very useful liquid for generating rad bolts, as I covered in their own tutorial bite. The key building here is obviously the research reactor. It takes enriched uranium, delivered by an auto sweeper, and water as a coolant, then it consumes the enriched uranium, producing nuclear waste and 400 degree water that falls and becomes steam. The auto sweeper is needed because the area around the reactor is highly irradiated. I've also included two layers of lead metal tiles to make the surrounding area safer for dupes too. You can use this area for rad bolt generators if you aren't using nuclear waste compression. To deliver the fuel, there is a conveyor chute that drops the enriched uranium nearby. A simple way to do this is to use a conveyor loader set to manual use and only enriched uranium. Then the dupes will sweep all the enriched uranium on the map into this area, just make sure the dupes can't get in here. Now the nuclear waste and steam produced fall below the reactor. In this area we deal with both, and let's start with the steam. This is collected with the steam turbines, generating power and deleting the heat. 9 or 10 is the ideal number to manage the heat output, and the exact layout here isn't that important. There are two tile high channels for the steam to go down to reach the turbines. Looking in the plumbing overlay, this is the most important part. The steam turbines return water to the steam room, but the top six turbines also feed the reactor as coolant. Bridges are used to prioritise the water flow, as I covered in the pipes tutorial bite. 
The build should work as a closed system, eventually not requiring any water from outside. But to ensure this never runs low, I still keep an external water line bridged on as a backup. This is because there are two ways to cause a reactor meltdown, and both can be caused by this water. The first way is by not having enough coolant going into the reactor, hence the external water line. But the second way is if the reactor overpressures, which happens at 150 kg per tile. This shouldn't happen under normal operating conditions, but pay close attention to the levels. The other key bit of plumbing here is the cooling loop that cools the turbines. These generate a significant amount of heat, and I've used a polluted water loop and two steel aqua tuners. You could use supercoolant and have one aqua tuner. For the pipe thermo sensor, I've set this to above 35 degrees Celsius, but it just needs to be low enough to keep the steam turbines from overheating. I explained cooling loops in depth in their own tutorial bite. Then the final part of this design is the nuclear waste collection at the bottom. This is quite simple, and there's a little area to collect it. A liquid pump takes this out when the level is high enough, and I've set this to above 500 kilograms. Remember that the pump needs to be made out of steel as well, to not overheat. The nuclear waste output is ideal for infinite compression to make rad bolts. I showed this idea in the rad bolts tutorial bite, with a bit of petroleum stopping the vent from overpressuring. To start up the design, simply feed water into the reactor and keep the external line connected. You can also add water directly into the steam chamber to increase levels, and I have around 10 kilograms in the middle here. And that's all there is for the simple nuclear reactor design, so here is the one take reference. So having covered the simple design, I also wanted to share a more advanced and more powerful design the Coolant Limited Research Reactor, or CLRR. I need to credit Nedigo here, who wrote an extensive forum post with this idea, from which most of this design is based. This works very similarly to the simple reactor, but with one key difference. We limit the incoming water coolant. Doing this increases the temperature of the nuclear waste produced, from about 400 degrees Celsius to around 2000 degrees, therefore giving a net power output of about 24 kilowatts, an almost six times improvement from the same amount of fuel. There are actually very few differences between this design and the simple one I just showed. The first is obviously that it's bigger, and there are now 45 steam turbines instead of 10. And there is the addition of the liquid valve to limit the coolant. Note that when starting up the design, you will want to run this at full flow and add more water until the steam reaches about 100 kg per tile in the middle of the design. To cool the additional turbines, there are now four aqua tuners placed around the single cooling loop. The automation and bypass for these is the same as a single aqua tuner system, there are just four of them. I've used supercoolant in the loop for simplicity. Nuclear waste can be used, as per Nedigo's original design, but the downside to that is that nuclear waste will spill out of the aqua tuners, meaning they need to be contained in their own area. Polluted water could be used with 6 to 8 aqua tuners. There is also a change to the steam turbine's water return, and extra liquid vents are added to cool the aqua tuners if required. A thermosensor will open these if the temperature is above 200 degrees. Another change is the addition of an extra heat transfer loop of nuclear waste, metal tiles and diamond temp shift plates. These are needed to quickly cool the nuclear waste, which is created so hot that it will turn into a gas if not cooled very quickly. I filled this from the nuclear waste pool by bridging on when starting up the reactor normally. You can deconstruct this bridge once filled, and I've just left it in for demonstration. Finally, as the nuclear waste is so hot, even after transferring most of the heat, we can also get some more as it's pumped out. 
This is brought out in a radiant pipe below more steam turbines, before being put into storage. A liquid valve limits the flow to 2 kg per second to maximise the heat transfer out. And that's all of the changes for this more advanced but more powerful reactor design. Here is the one take reference for it. And also the individual layers, as it's quite large. So that's all for this guide to nuclear power in oxygen not included. I hope this helps you with these useful machines, and thanks for watching.